Okay, um, uh, welcome everybody. I'm uh, Tony Addison, a uh, non-resident research fellow at uh, UNIW, and a professor of um, development economics uh, at uh, the University of Copenhagen. Uh, people are just um, flowing into the meeting now, and we have quite a large number. If I could ask everybody to keep their microphones muted. Uh, this um, webinar is uh, one of the series of uh, webinars in WIDA's uh, domestic revenue mobilization research program, uh, which has been going on now for nearly four years. The webinar today is a collaboration between two themes of DRM, the Extractives for Development theme, uh, which is led by myself, and the Illicit Financial Flows theme, which is led by Professor Finn Tart of DRG Copenhagen University. In this one hour event, uh, we are going to have three speakers on the theme today, which is corruption and theft in the global oil and gas sector. The first speaker will be Etienne Romsom. Etienne is president of Energy CC, a uh, institution which is particularly concerned with climate impacts in the oil and gas sector. He is a former global executive vice president for DNVGL and managing director of Shell Exploration and Production in Kuwait, where he developed and led many complex projects in oil and gas. Uh, Etienne has authored two wider working papers on global oil theft, and we'll be putting the links to those papers in the chat, uh, as well as co-authoring two further papers for the wider project with Catherine McPhail, also of Energy CC, on gas flaring and venting, which I do recommend you take a look at. Our second speaker today will be uh, Giovanni Marcolongo, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Crime and Law <laughs> and Economic Analysis Unit at Bocconi University, where she works on crime economics and political economy. Uh, Giovanna has authored a paper for WIDA on the role of shell companies in tax havens as facilitators of corruption in oil and gas. Oil and gas. And uh, we'll, we'll be again putting a link into the chat uh, for Giovanna's paper. Our third uh, speaker, who will be acting actually as discussant, is Steve Kaizi Magewa, who is a senior consultant researcher at Zika and Associates uh, in Washington, DC. Steve was previously acting chief economist and vice president of the African Development Bank, an IMF staff member in the independent evaluation unit of the fund, a research fellow, and has advised uh, many African governments. Etienne will give the first presentation, followed by Giovanna, and then Steve will provide discussion of the two. Uh, we will take a selection of questions for the panel from the chat, bearing in mind that this is a one hour webinar and we aim to try and finish roughly on time. So welcome everybody. And let us without further ado, move to the presentation by Etienne Romson. Etienne, please. Thanks, uh, Tony, for the uh, introduction. I'll uh, share my screen. And hopefully that I'm just checking if that is uh, visible. Yes, that's visible. Okay. So let me uh, let me start. And I, I want to start the, uh, the topic of uh, global oil theft. Um, with actually a, a video uh, kindly uh, created by uh, UNU wider. Uh, so I'm going to play it now and hopefully it will come through okay.
Oh, that was that. Uh, okay, indeed. Um, so actually the video gave um, the key messages already, <laughs> but um, let me give some more background to, to oil theft and, and some key observations from the, the study work that I've, I've done. So in this um, first slide, uh, you can see a sample of known oil theft cases. And, and this is by no means a complete list of, of the known thefts. And moreover, many thefts are not, dis are not discovered nor, nor reported. Uh, what this overview does show is that uh, oil theft is, uh, is a global phenomenon and it affects many countries. And uh, although low and middle income countries are often worst affected by it, Oil theft is not a developing country's problem. Um, the UK, the US, and Singapore are all examples where uh, large oil theft uh, do, do occur. So some observations on, on oil theft. Um, first of all, the scale of uh, global oil theft is, is highly significant. And, and there are no signs that the, 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 the amount of money involved or the, 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 the amount of oil that's being stored in is receding. Current uh, high oil prices not only increase the value of thefts, um, but also incentivize more thefts. Uh, and, and, and that can be understood through the following example, because and uh, for example, smuggling increases when price differentials between countries increase. And, and if prices are kept in say country A, but prices follow global market prices in neighboring country B, then increased market prices will increase the margins of smuggling from country A and B. And there's significant evidence that that is indeed in practice the case. Uh, the degree of smuggling and tax evasion is directly linked to cross-border price differentials. However, smuggling and tax evasion are only a subset of the range of potential crimes. Uh, unfortunately, many oil theft uh, crimes occur with violence. In addition, digital crimes, so as recently the US colonial pipe, um, pipeline ransomware attack in 2021, exemplify the diverse methods of oil thieves. There are many ways in which oil theft crimes and crime syndicates establish themselves. Um, but even if a theft originates as an opportunity crime, the crime syndicates responsible invariably develop into organized crime. One key reason for this is that the proceeds of oil theft are so large that it makes it worthwhile to professionalize it. Uh, in addition, oil theft schemes are often very elaborate and does therefore require coordination amongst multiple parties and therefore organization. Uh, moreover, the probability of oil theft detection is, is relatively low and oil theft doesn't rank high amongst other crimes. So consequently, syndicates organize their crimes so that they can continue the same thefts again and again. Uh, the Shell Bukum refinery theft in Singapore, for example, occurred over a period of 12 years and involved multiple syndicates. In this period, a total of 340,000 tons of gas oil was stolen, worth over $150 million US. The Shell Bukum oil theft syndicates involved Shell employees, bunkering companies, fuel traders, tanker shipping companies, ship crews, surveying companies, and black market fuel customers. In this example, Shell insiders volunteered willingly and masterminded the crimes. However, in other cases, such as in Pemex, Mexico, oil workers are often confronted with extreme violence and kidnapping of their family members to support the cartels in their theft crimes. Oil theft is also a source of public money for, or a source of money for terrorist organizations, such as ISIS, or for political uh, independence organizations. Unfortunately, there are many stories of oil theft. The Benin example shows that the fallout of oil theft on this country's economy, even though Benin has no oil production and very little official fuel imports, Benin has no oil to steal that was not already stolen. However, in 2011, there was a series of pirate attacks on the coast of Benin, mostly targeting oil companies, uh, oil tankers rather, that caused this region to be reclassified as a high risk region by insurance companies. Hence, Shipping companies avoided this area altogether. The port of Contenu is a major source of income for the Benin government. 
when port activity declined with 70%, the government lost 28% of its revenue in 2012. Even to date, oil piracy remains a problem also in the Gulf of Guinea. And at least two tankers were attacked in the last few days. Acts of piracy appear to be contagious, as you can see waves of activity spreading from East Africa to Asia and now increasingly to West Africa. Of the potential piracy targets, oil tankers remain on the top of the list. If it's not to hijack their cargoes, then it is to kidnap their international ship crews. Oil theft is causing great harm to the health and, and the environment. And while oil companies are increasingly being held responsible for emissions, there are few activities so environmentally damaging as oil theft. The emissions from artisanal refineries are orders of magnitude higher than from any commercial refinery. The scale of the problem is truly enormous. In 2013, it was reported that more than a thousand of such refineries were destroyed by the authorities in, in Nigeria and often the destruction went with increased um, environmental damage. I conservatively estimate that in Nigeria alone, more than 200,000 barrels a day of stolen crude is processed in such facilities. Nigeria does not stand alone in this. In Russia, these illegal polluting refineries occur also and called samovars there, uh, like the tea kettles. ISIS use the same chemical process to fund their terrorism. Ground pollution from oil thefts, from pipeline thefts, is another key problem. In 2018, Mexican authorities identified more than 12,500 illegal pipeline thefts. In Nigeria, pipeline vandalism was reported 21,000 times in the period 2010 to 2014. It is common for these theft pipelines to explode when locals gather to scoop up part of the spoils. In 2019, a gasoline pipeline that was being tapped in Mexico exploded and killed at least 137 people. The worst recorded event is in Nigeria in 1998, where a similar event um, caused the death of more than 1,082 people. One of the key observations of my studies is that oil theft very frequently and diversifies or originates from the so-called hard crimes. And there are many reasons for this, and I highlight a few. Oil theft is so lucrative that thieves frequently target other thieves for their spoils or to take over their territory. These crime on crime activities are generally extremely violent. The skill set involved in oil theft is very practical and practicable in other crimes. The Mexican cartels, for example, use their skills in burying and burying smuggling tunnels. Now also to dig tunnel uh, to dig tunnels under pipelines to invisibly tap them from below ground. Smuggling routes for oil theft are also used for smuggling weapons, narcotics, counterfeit um, pharmaceuticals, and human trafficking. Very often this occurs on their return journey. Crime syndicates are businesses that are very skilled in risk management and diversifications. And when cartels are being pursued, for, for example, for, the, for drugs, they switch to oil and vice versa. The syndicates know that they are being pursued for a certain type of activity and then flexibly adapt to reduce their exposure in this area and increase their focus in other crime areas that are at that moment less in focus. So you may ask, why is oil theft more, not given more priority by the international community? In addition to the recent shows on this slide, I think that the impact of oil theft is generally underestimated. First of all, people under, tend to underestimate the scale of global oil thefts. In addition, the wider consequences of oil theft are, have not been well understood. And in particular, this aspect I've been focusing on in my work. Oil thefts are often very well hidden and to tackle the problem requires a lot of effort. Note that oil and fuel are not illegal substances, contrary to drugs and arms. And so someone in position, possession of truckloads full of fuel is not necessarily breaking the law. Another key piece of the puzzle is that the basic data on oil theft is generally missing. 
Key questions need answers, such as how much oil is being stolen? Where is it stolen? How is it stolen? And where is it transported to? And how are the money flows organized? When oil theft is unchecked, these criminal activities start to penetrate legitimate businesses, sometimes to provide active cover to thefts. Often, however, these legitimate companies have no idea that they're handling stolen goods or that they are sponsoring criminal activity that goes well beyond oil theft. The opportunity to make money from oil theft goes much beyond ideology. For example, the largest purchaser of oil stolen and processed by ISIS was the Assad regime itself. So while the oil theft syndicates are inventive and well-organized, there are many opportunities to make it much more difficult to conduct their illegal businesses. These solutions focus on the three areas where answers are most needed. Where is the oil stolen? Where and how is it transported and traded? And how are the money flows organized? The purpose of this slide is to show that many solutions can be implemented today and are the focus of collaboration uh, amongst parties. Other solutions focus on improved regulations or apply exist or the application of existing regulations specifically to target oil theft. Finally, technologies provide an important opportunity, particularly in identifying theft events and the transport of stolen oil. Remote sensing by satellites is one of such technologies. For example, when pirates turn off the ship transponders, also called the AIS, after boarding a vessel, it takes six days or more to actually find the vessel. In this time, anything can happen to the crew and the cargo. It should be possible to use satellite technologies to detect ships through its fuel emissions or radar signals, particularly if this is done immediately when the AI signal, AIS signal disappears. Other technologies have proven to be highly effective are chemical traces that can detect if an oil parcel is legitimate or stolen and even where it was stolen. All these opportunities give hope and means to significantly reduce global oil theft. However, a solution does require an effort by multiple parties to collaborate in solving these issues together. Only through a concerted approach on multiple fronts can we hold oil theft syndicates to account and bring a halt to their detrimental practices. Here on the slide, you see a number of those organizations that in my view are quite critical to work together to provide solutions um, to this problem. And with that, I conclude my presentation. And if you have any questions, please note them down in the chat and we'll follow up uh, after my presentation, after the presentations are finished. Thank you. Good, thank you very much, um, Etienne. And uh, as uh, Etienne just said, we will be uh, posting links to the uh, papers and there are many interesting papers uh, on the wider website. Uh, we now turn to uh, Giovanna from uh, Bocconi University. So welcome Giovanna uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for inviting me and thank you, Professor Addison, first uh, for the event and on wider for the organization. So today I'm going to talk about the research that I conducted within the uh, initiative sponsored by UniWider together with Diego Zambiasi, who's a lecturer at Newcastle University. So the title is From Offshore Oil to Offshore Finance. And I want to start my presentation just giving you two numbers that uh, give you maybe an idea of what we're talking about. So in a report by the OECD in 2014, they looked at uh, case of international bribes and specifically at the sectors in which international bribes or transnational bribes were more frequently observed. Well, among the different sectors here, I showed that two thirds of them, and this picture is taken from their report, where there were four sectors that actually covered the majority or two thirds of the cases of transnational bribes. But there was one sector and it was extractive where about one fifth or 19% of all bribes were concentrated. So it seems that the extractive sector, as uh, maybe the presentation that preceded me already pointed out, actually offers some uh, um, environment, let's say, for corruption. 
And then, well, we're not the first to study corruption and offering policy suggestions to how to fight corruption in the case of the extractive sector. And I've seen among the participants, there's also someone from the Natural Resource Governance Initiative. Well, we carefully read a paper or actually a report that was published by the National uh, the Natural Resources Governance Initiatives, where they analyze a hundred cases of corruption specifically in the moment that happens uh, when there is a, um, the awarding of licenses and contracts. Among the different cases that were reported there, well, there are 28 that uh, are also analyzed in detail in the report and eight of them, so between one fourth and a third of these cases, they saw the involvement of shell companies in the scheme of corruption. So what are we after here? So we are asking whether the award of oil and gas licenses does increase corruption or is tied to corruption or it creates an environment where corruption is more likely to happen. Well, as you may guess, this is not gonna be an easy task to analyze, especially for economists who are always behind and looking for data, but uh, we're gonna show what we will try to do. So let's just start from one of the protagonists of this study. So we're talking about awarding of licensing in oil blocks and corruption. So let's start from the licensing and the oil blocks. Well, as we maybe already know, there are large investments that happen in the sector of uh, oil extraction and oil production. And typically the moment in which there's gonna be uh, the award of contracts or licenses is a peculiar moment because it's a moment that requires a large investment because clearly infrastructures that are required for exploration, production and development are highly costly, but also the returns that may come from these investments are very high and they can also last for a long period. And typically, if we look specifically at the moment of the awarding of oil licenses, well, this happened through different procedures. And uh, I apologize here for oversimplifying here the explanation, but uh, uh, typically there are two kinds of procedure. One is a direct negotiation. So the potential contractor is gonna just uh, ask to the government or knock on the door. It's called an open door policy of the government to have a direct negotiation or they're gonna participate in licensing rounds. And licensing rounds are typically some specific moment during which a country decides that are gonna award, that's gonna award a certain number of permits or licenses to oil blocks. And this is also gonna be the focus of our study. Well, typically the areas or the blocks are they belong to the government of a country, to the country itself. And so it's gonna be the government that's gonna be directly involved in the awarding of the oil blocks. And we can already see that this is gonna involve therefore ministries and public figures in the awarding. And they're gonna have a really critical role with high discretion. Then uh, when we're thinking of licensing, and uh, this is just a, a little bit of context that I'm gonna give uh, in this case, it's gonna say that I'm talking about two types of licenses. So there are multiple types of licenses, but here let's uh, again, uh, apologize for oversimplify, but we're gonna focus on exploration licenses and production licenses. So what's the difference between the two? Well, typically, Let's say that we wanna start a company that uh, is gonna uh, produce oil tomorrow. Well, we may consider to start exploring an oil block where no discovery has already happened. And then in case we find oil there, then we're gonna maybe ap apply for uh, a production license. So clearly the exploration is something that has a risk associated with that because we may find or not oil. And usually the um, time of the award or the permission to explore an area lasts between five and 10 years. While the production is something that happens once we already know that oil is there then we can guess that probably an exploration license, it's probably in some cases is a prerequisite to apply for a production license. So suppose that there are, there's a moment when the government is gonna allow to award uh, production licenses. 
Well, sometimes it's gonna only allow people that have already carried out an expiration and had an expiration license. So if going back to our example, where we're starting our oil company tomorrow, our production company, if we deem that uh, there's gonna be a large oil field in a specific area, then we're probably gonna try our best bet to get an exploration license first in order to tomorrow, in case we find the actual oil field, we're gonna be able and have higher chances to gain also a production license. Okay, so going back to our question, which was does the award of oil and gas licenses increase corruption? I talked about the awarding moment now, and then let's focus on the corruption moment. Okay, so as we were saying, there are large rents that come from these investments. And uh, uh, I apologize, I, just, I heard some noise. Okay, so there are high, large rents that come from investment in this specific uh, sector, and particularly in, the, in investing in getting a permit for an oil exploration. And then there is high discussion because we were saying that the government is directly involved in the awarding procedure. Well, these are two typical suspects that increase the risk of corruption in the sector. But then as uh, Etienne was saying before, well, in the case of oil theft, it's gonna be hard to find data on oil theft. Well, also in the case of the awarding of uh, licenses and uh, finding data on corruption of oil licenses is gonna be a bit tricky. But here we're building on the work uh, that uh, I mentioned initially. So as I was saying, the natural resources governance initiatives, when they study the different cases of uh, uh, corruption occurring in the awarding of contracts, they underline how shy companies often play a role in facilitating corruption. And here we can think, uh, and I'm gonna exemplify just three cases of why shell companies could play a role. So first, if we think that there's gonna be an option on an awarding procedure of uh, uh, oil permits, well, there's gonna be a bunch of companies probably that are gonna apply to gain the award. And uh, it could be the case that among these companies, they're gonna be companies that are linked to politically exposed people, if not directly owned by politically exposed people. And these are shell companies that actually do not own the infrastructure and the capabilities to carry out the necessary investment to take advantage of the exploration and production. But still they have a vested interest in winning the award and then in case transferring it to a company that does have the actual capability as infrastructure. So the shell company here will offer the opportunity to the person that's involved, say the uh, person that's linked to the politically exposed person or the politician himself to hide his identity via a shell company, win, for example, the permit and then resell it. Another case could be that companies that are participating in the awarding round they have, they're gonna try, for example, to bribe the politicians or to bribe uh, the people who are administering the process. And uh, clearly it's gonna be um, easier to hide and uh, to carry out their bargaining procedure behind a secret uh, layer as provided by a shell company compared to doing it at uh, um, like uh, clearly and just directly within the country. So one way, for, for example, the company could set up a shell company offshore, direct the money there, and then make as a beneficiary of that company, the politician or someone that's linked to the politician who's involved in the awarding procedure. Ultimately, the same politician himself could be interested in embezzling some of the rents that are coming, for example, from the signing bonus of the award. And in this case, he could decide to, or he or she could decide to siphon off some of the funds by channeling them to a shell company that's tied to him or of whom of which he is the ultimate beneficiary. So these are just some examples of how shell companies could play a role in facilitating corruption in a critical moment, as is the moment of the awarding of oil licenses. So just some descriptive evidence of what we do find. 
So this is just uh, to give you an idea of how we started essentially this project. So these three lines that are being uh, um, graphed on the picture, each represent a different time series or a different uh, uh, evolution of either in the case of uh, the green dots is the total number of shell companies that are being incorporated over time. The blue line is the oil price over time. And in that, and the red line or the line at the bottom is the number of awards being need for exploration permits in this case that are being awarded over time. So I'm showing this picture to show you how the three series actually move together very closely. Or in other words, when there is like an increase in the number of the awards, we observe also, and that's the red line at the bottom, we also observe an increase in the number of shy companies that are happening uh, in, the, in the same period. And the blue line is to say, why shall we think also that all price plays a role in this case? Well, if oil price increases, well, the rent of the investment in the oil oh. sector are probably gonna be higher because then that means that the oil we find, then we can sell it at a higher price. So the same uh, contract or the same license could be more profitable. And then it could be more likely that uh, uh, we are willing to uh, get involved in a corruption scheme. So in other words, when there is a, uh, oil price increase, there is high profit, higher profitability from the investment, and that could lead to a higher chance of corruption. So what do we find actually? And uh, to transfer that uh, graph that I've shown you into some words, well, we do find that uh, when there is uh, uh, in the six months around the awarding of an exploration license, we observe an increase of 11% in the number of shy companies whose beneficiaries are tied to the country or they belong to the country that's uh, uh, awarding the contract. And this association is actually stronger during an oil boom, or in other words, when there is an increase in the price of oil, and uh, we're about to award, and a country is about to award an exploration permit, we observe an even further increase in the number of shelf companies that uh, are being incorporated compared to when there is no increase in the price of oil. But then uh, you can ask me, but how do you find all of this? Well, going back to the two protagonists of our story, we were talking about awarding of, shy, uh, awarding of exploration and uh, production permit and shark company. So we obtained data from a business intelligence, intelligence provider on where the blocks are placed around the world and when different uh, oil permits are being awarded uh, and uh, being needed for exploration or production in the different blocks in the different countries over time. So here we have one protagonist. The other protagonist is the shell companies. Here we exploit leaked data from the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers. This was a large investigation that uh, uh, was actually made public between 2016 and 2018. And it was the first time that uh, uh, it was, we were able to observe the identities, the identities of the people behind shy companies that had been incorporated mainly in the Caribbean and uh, by essentially Mossack Fonseca and Apple B as two uh, main companies that were involved in the incorporation of shell companies. And uh, here there is like a caveat that's important, which is that not for all the companies that uh, these journalists actually gain information about, we were able to link them to some countries, but only for a third of them. But for these, uh, let's say about 240,000 companies that we were able to link to a company, what we observe, we know when those companies were actually started. So what we do is essentially we look at one country and we say, let's observe the timing at which a country is awarding exploration and production permits. And uh, let's see what's the dynamic or how many new shell companies are being incorporated in the period of the uh, awarding. So around the six months of the award. And let's compare the same dynamic in shell companies to a country that in the same period is not awarding any shell company, any uh, oil or exploration or production permit. 
And let's see whether we observe a different dynamic or a different change in the number of shelf companies that are being incorporated in those countries that are actually awarding the permits compared to the ones that are not awarding the permits. You only have a few minutes left. Yes, I should like uh, I should be almost done. So what we expect is that uh, when a country is awarding a shell, uh, um, some permits, then we should observe a higher increase in the shell companies that uh, are being opened by this country compared to a country that is not awarding. And this is even higher when there is an increase in the oil of price because it's making the uh, investment even more productive and the, the rent to extracts are even higher. So to summarize with the picture of what we're doing, uh, we observe here that there are three different bars and three different markers. So each bar refers to a different type of permits that's being awarded. So the first bar is saying, do we observe an increase in offshore shell companies whenever in the six months around the award of any license? Well, this bar touches the zero uh, the zero marker. And so economists, when they observe this, they say, well, it doesn't seem the case because like, we cannot distinguish it from a zero. Instead, when we look at exploration license and remember that these are the most remunerative ones, we observe that uh, in the six months around the awarding of an exploration license, there seems to be an 11% increase in the, shell, uh, in the incorporation of shell companies. And this does not seem to be the case, again, in the case of production license, the reason being that it's still touching the zero. Okay, and then given that I'm running out of time, I just want to say that the different numbers in this picture are just saying that when there is an increase in the oil price, the increase in shell companies is even higher compared to when there is no increase in the oil price. And again, the reason being that now a permit is even more remunerative. And so maybe there is like a higher incentive to uh, get involved in corruption. Okay, so to conclude, so we started by saying that the OECD estimated that 19% of transnational bribes are related to the extractive sector. And uh, as also in the video that we started with, uh, we uh, was mentioned, this is a problem, and especially in countries that are characterized by low growth. And so this calls for an urgent response of policymakers. And uh, we, in particular, focus on the role that companies play in fostering corruption. And essentially, this is a call for more transparency, both in the people who are behind the shared companies and as well in the whole procedure of the awarding of licenses. And I'll stop here and happy to discuss more later. Thank you very much, Giovanna, and the papers are available on the wider website. So now I'd like to turn to um, Steve Kaizi Magewa. Uh, Steve, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is uh, Zika Associates, Washington. He was previously acting chief economist and vice president of the African Development Bank, and also an IMF staff member, among many other things. So, uh, Steve, over to you. Uh, very, very, very many thanks, uh, Tony, for your very generous uh, introductions. Uh, also, thank you, Waida, for bringing me back again to comment on these very interesting papers. I found them extremely interesting. Um, I hope I will do justice to them in less than 10 minutes. So I'm going to be brief. Uh, when I look at the papers, I, I had four immediate sort of responses and questions. The first one was that um, it seems that like natural resources, especially oil, are sustaining a group or a couple of corrupt individuals and institutions around the world to bend the rules of the international uh, governance system and uh, with impunity, by the way. And, and the question arises, what can we do about it? So that's the first one. The second one was, um, interestingly, the cases are not confined to the usual suspects, the different, the difficult to run places of the world in Sub-Saharan Africa. It seems to be all over the global South and even some countries in the developed world. So our question there is, is con our convergence of global thinking would that be able to change behavior, you think? 
And the third question or, or comment that I, I had was that uh, the research, both of your researchers, uh, Giovanna and Etienne, uh, they seem to suggest that uh, the importance of creating credible, uh, credible institutions and agencies of this strength. But the question is, how would this be established? Under what kind of formats? And what do you think would be the implications for um, the environmental concerns that we have that Etienne brought out, including uh, the movement towards uh, net zero? And lastly, uh, in terms of the questions that came to my mind was uh, how to put uh, some kind of theoretical or analytical discussion around uh, the topics, uh, very interesting topics that you are discussing. So in the current uh, political economy literature, uh, I see a chance, uh, some of the things you're raising up under the literature of greed and grievance, which uh, occupied a lot of debate a while ago that you on one, on one hand, you have uh, politicians are going and say, oh, you know, we, we have this political grievance, this, we are not respected, da, 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 da. And then when they get in, they are caught up by the greed of grabbing as much of this oil or the gas or whatever as possible. And for Giovanna, also, there is this whole literature on political finance as opposed to political economy, yes, political finance, where a whole lot of this money, by the way, is packed. A lot of the money is packed in all these places in the Caribbean and so on. But in a lot of cases, it doesn't stay there forever. You should, uh, I don't know if you've been to Africa, but you should attend some of the, the election campaigns in some of the places. They look like American election campaigns and you wonder where the money has come from. So these, these these places are packing places. They pack the money there and they bring it up to do a lot of political work. So political finance is one aspect of it. So again, very quickly, I don't, as I said, have much time, but when I looked at the papers by Etienne, the two very interesting papers, very nicely interconnected, something came to my mind that I put a kind of rubric on them and there is, that there is method to madness. That's what I, I thought when I read through them. There is this complex structure of natural resource uh, value extraction, the, uh, the, which is always much more complicated in terms of financing, in terms of the technology than the countries where these things happen. So then that is used, of course, in all sorts of ways. But the linkages are incredible because they go up even to the UN system. You can imagine. I mean, the UN would be the ultimate arbiter of these things, but uh, sometimes they're also implicated. As you point out, for the case of uh, food for food for oil in Iraq and so on. So you have this very complicated uh, technology, it's very really complicated financing, spy imposed on very weak institutional structures and regulatory structures on the ground. And of course, as you say, the risks are very low, relative to the high, high returns. And of course, you have specialization there and protecting the, the, the tough and so on. And I very much like your reference to something called the cappuccino effect, which some of you who read the papers will find uh, very fascinating. But uh, essentially what it is, is you add a bit of fluff on top, you put gas into, into the oil, or you put air really into the oil and the volumes increase and you sell it. So very, very interesting ways. And when reading through um, a change papers, I thought of new places like Uganda, which is very excited about its oil production. Uh, interestingly, uh, which is very interesting and attractive to the population. They're really hoping to, to cash in uh, but then you have this extremely long pipeline. It's going to be over 2,000 kilometers to, 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 to the sea from, from Uganda. And you have, you're going to have all these sophisticated technologies once again. So you really worry. And then, of course, you have poor civil servants, poorly paid civil servants. You worry about the implications uh, down the road. The same data for Nigeria, which has had oil for the last 50 years. And you have, again, political ambition. 
you have uh, uh, grievance superimposed on greed, and uh, the situation becomes quite uh, complicated. Now, turning to uh, Yovana, again, I found your, your, your paper very, very interesting. And the small rubric I put on top of yours is, if there's nowhere to hide, why not try home? And what I mean by that is that, yes, you might close all these uh, places and uh, shell companies and so on, but uh, the corrupt people will find a way. And what, to my mind, is happening today is that um, the money is being kept in a lot of African countries that I know. I'm giving examples, it's not just happening in Africa, but I know Africa quite well. And uh, you can find all these five-star hotels uh, on, on, in, in, you know, and, and houses that cost one million US dollars. I mean, to get a house of one million US dollars here in the US would be <laughs> something. But there are so many houses there, and you wonder how civil servants are able to do this. Okay, so they, if we can't take our money to shell companies, we can't take our money to Switzerland, we might as well do something about it, keep it at home. So there's a lot of impunity in the system that is a bit difficult to, to get uh, rid of, it would seem. So you have real estate booms, five-star hotels, the, the, the phenomenon of your Benz is smaller than mine. People are buying all these sophisticated cars just to get going. But I also asked myself when I was reading your paper about the technology of transferring this money. Uh, the cryptocurrencies and so on. These are not African technologies, they're Western technologies. I'm very, very sure that the, the agencies, the security agencies in all these countries know what's happening. Uh, and they could probably help. The problem is how can you get them on board? Because somebody knows that these things are happening. I'll give you an example related to, to this. Whenever there was a study that whenever the IMF or the World Bank made a big disbursement to a country, X, in Africa, there would in a very short time be big transfer, not necessarily of that money, but because money is fungible, there's already enough foreign exchange in the system, then you see a transfer of that money going out. So some of these things are known. And the question is, would there be a coalition of the willing to try and stop these activities going forward? So let me, uh, again, thank you very much for what I thought were interesting papers and try to conclude in one or two sentences. Um, some of the solutions that Etienne and maybe even uh, Giovanna suggests uh, to appeal to some moral economy, uh, to the hearts and minds of the people and so on. But my question is, what if the whole system is sort of captured as you have seen in some cases, where the local elites, you see what happens is in some of these places, the local elites are stealing money you might see them as uh, crooks, but there's a section of the population that sees them as our sons and daughters. They're bringing the bread home and so on. So how do we deal with that kind of thing that is, again, sort of going around? And, and um, I would say that uh, solutions, rightly, that will really impact what is happening on the ground, surprisingly, uh, uh, are given by the example of the new president of Tanzania. She's uh, a lady called uh, President Samia. Quite a uh, low key during the last time of the, 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 the last president who just passed a while ago. She came in unassuming and people thought that she was going to be a walkover because she comes from a small island uh, linked to, to Tanzania. But very, very soon, she has really gone systematically uh, 
attacking this or this dismantling and so on a lot of these corruption cartels in the country the question is how do such leaders emerge we don't know not even the east should you, should we just wait for happens miracle to happen like that one so that is a big question. I don't really have answers to this, but those are some of the big questions that uh, came to my mind as I read these very interesting papers. Thank you so much. Great, thank you very much, uh, Steve. So uh, we're now just gonna turn to um, the sponsors from uh, um, Etienne and Giovanna, but I'm gonna, uh, as you think about your responses, just to some of uh, Steve's many points and, um, we're starting to run out of time. One issue that's come up in the chat, and there are quite a lot of comments in the chat, is, is how much should we be relying on voluntary practices by the companies? How much should we be looking to more stricter regulation? Um, and you know who's going to be responsible for overseeing that? And uh, one specific question for um, Etienne that, um, that came up was, uh, if default emission penalties are assessed on oil companies, Etienne, default emissions penalties are assessed on oil companies, will this change incentives towards or against illegal activity? Okay, so I'd like to hand over now to Etienne for a brief response and then to Giovanna. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I'll also try in the meantime to respond to some of the questions that have come in and, and some of the overlap between Giovanna's and, and my presentation. I, mean, I think if I were to summarize, I would say uh, oil theft and corruption is a business. And that's why it links to oil price. I said the same thing in my presentation. If oil price goes up, the oil theft goes up. And, and Giovanna shows the the, um, uh, the, the, the corruption goes up. And then, uh, clearly that's a business response to an external driver. And um, let that be no mistake, the, 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 the organizations and companies that are behind these activities know very well what they're doing and they're excellent in managing risks and uh, extremely clever in finding new business methods to continue what is a very lucrative um, kind of kind of deal. It's not a one-off. It's, it's it's clearly a, a business proposition. Um, I want to quickly react to one of the questions that came in. This is a quite difficult one, and I described it in my report in quite a bit of detail. This is the whole thing about moral economy um, that, that was just uh, raised as well. Uh, like, if the government cannot take care of distribution of, of uh, energy access for its people, then you shouldn't be a surprised that if uh, how to say, uh, uh, other organizations, illegal organizations will do it for you and, and give the people what they need. And, and I, 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 I understand the, the, the rationale, but still I think it's a flawed argument. Um, the, this is probably the biggest negative of uh, oil theft and corruption practices that actually undermines legitimate governments in the long run. Uh, by giving handouts and 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 uh, uh, involving people in theft and and, and uh, corrupt practices as part of the scheme, uh, and ultimately it doesn't help the the society at all. Um, of course, the job the government has a job to do to provide energy access to its people, but uh, through these practices, actually, it's 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 compromised in doing so. So it's a bit of cause and effect. But I think the the root cause of the problem is the theft of the government. Okay, um, thank you very much, um, Etienne. So, um, uh, Giovanna, briefly, would you like to respond to some yes. of Steve's made or anything that's come up? Perhaps yes. Some... Yeah, definitely. Okay. So, thanks again. Like, uh, especially thank you. One, some of the questions that you raised are probably some million dollar questions as well. But uh, if I want to give like my contribution, so I was actually thinking how to translate these into practical suggestions. And I think that there are some progress. So maybe we cannot solve it in one day, but there is some progress that can be done. So for example, going back to the specific case of the awarding of oil licenses, well, as I was saying, there are some companies that are applying and they don't have the infrastructure capabilities. So we should first 
impose or maybe it should be mandatory that the companies that participate do have the requirements in terms of infrastructure and capital to carry out check that they are not linked to politically exposed persons. But then going back to the question of the chat, shall we rely on the companies themselves to provide this? Well, no, probably this is a role that must be taken by super partners organization and international organizations. So as I mentioned before, there is already the natural resource governance uh, institution uh, that is already initiative that's already involved in this. And there have been also the, for example, in the case of oil profits, there are the IT standards that have been developed. So for example, the World Bank made uh, some uh, disbursement of loans on countries meeting some standards in the reporting of their oil proceeds and their oil profits. So similar standards could be implemented also in the awarding of um, oil permits. So let's say, uh, for example, again, either for the disbursement of international aid or World Bank aid, well, this is gonna be dispersed as long as a country also meets some requirements in terms of standardization of the process and in the awarding procedures. And finally, uh, probably just to summarize all my discussion, the easiest uh, anecdote to all this is transparency. So it's true, as you were saying, that uh, uh, the shy companies are sometimes just uh, um, a stepping stone to then bring the money back. And uh, But the, my question again is, uh, do we know who are the owners of uh, the five-star hotel or are shy companies behind them? Because maybe if we go and have an opportunity to check who's behind them, then we may maybe can also make progress in terms of uh, um, fighting corruption. And uh, the very last point is, uh, who shall we expect to do this? Well, another point that I think it's relevant is that uh, in the way we measure corruption, typically, we ask, for example, people whether they had to pay uh, someone to get their procedure done. It's probably also time to get people to make people aware or to become all of us aware of the fact that corruption is not just paying someone to get an authorization for something. Sometimes corruption is also someone that is like a government uh, ministry and is uh, siphoning of money abroad. So even in the measure way we measure uh, corruption, and I'm talking about corruption perception index, we also as people, as grassroots, uh, as population, must become aware of the fact that corruption is, uh, it has different uh, uh, shapes and some of them are also uh, shell companies and siphoning money to tax savings. Thank you very much, uh, Giovanna. So, um, as I said at the very outset of the um, of the uh, webinar, uh, this uh, webinar has been brought to you under the wider DRM um, program, uh, and this particular webinar uh, reflects on two themes: extractors for development, uh, the theme that I've been leading, and illicit uh, financial flows that uh, Professor Finn Tarp of Copenhagen University has been leading. Um, so do visit our websites. There's a lot of material up there uh, for your interest. It remains for me to thank very much our speakers, uh, Etienne Romsom, uh, Giovanna Makalongo, and Steve Kaisi Magewa for their very interesting and stimulating presentations. I think you'll go away thinking this is a very important issue, which has been underemphasized by the global uh, community. There will be further uh, webinars in this series, so do look out for them on the wider website or on social media. And I'd like to thank uh, wider and the wider staff, um, uh, Yuta and Anna, for organizing uh, this meeting, the practicalities. So thank you wherever you are in the world. Um, thank you for coming and thank you for your participation. Thank you. Thank you.